ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the launch of our 10 SR Nathan Fellow, Dr. Nolin Hazel's book, Singapore and Multilateral Governance, Securing Our Future. We are grateful to everyone for taking time to join us today and are delighted to have our Minister of Foreign Affairs, Dr. Vivian Balakrishnan here as our guest of honour. Mr. Janadas Devan, Director of IPS, will begin with his welcome remarks. He will be followed by Minister Balakrishnan and finally, Dr. Nolin Hazel. We will then launch the book. After the launch, there will be a book signing session with Dr. Hazel. Before we begin, please put your, please put your mobile phones on silent mode. For other distinguished guests, friends of IPS and members of the public unable to join us in person today, we have invited them to tune into our Facebook page where we are live streaming the event. The live stream can also be watched after the event on our IPS Facebook page and YouTube channel. Online purchase of Dr. Hazel's book is now available on World Scientific Publishing's website. For the entire month of March, all volumes of the IPS Northern Lecture Series, including Dr. Hazel's book, can be purchased online with a 20% discount. Enter the promo code WSIPS20 for 20% off your purchase. Now, without further ado, Mr. Janadas Devon, Director of IPS, will deliver his welcome remarks. Director, please. Thank you all, Minister Vivian Balakrishnan, President of NUS, Dean of LKY School, our Special Advisor, uh, Professor Tommy Ko, Nolene, distinguished guests. Welcome to the launch of Singapore and Multilateral Governance, Securing Our Future. And thank you, Minister, for agreeing to launch Nolene's book. I must first begin by confessing my personal interest. There is some nepotism involved <laughs> here. I've known Nolene for 55 years, <laughs> since I was 15 or so. Huh? She was almost a surrogate daughter of my parents. Um, she first sailed into our lives as an impossibly beautiful young woman, as the great girlfriend, and then later fiance, and then wife of a firebrand Malaysian politician, Fan Yu Ting, of the Democratic Action Party. By that time, when we first met her, she had already become politically engaged herself, an activist in the then University of Singapore's Democratic Socialist Club. She had first intended to read literature and drama at Singapore University, but she was waylaid by one Lu Chun Yong, who's here, <laughs> who turned her interest to politics and sociology. Nolin, in turn, recruited others, including Tan Lian Chu, I think she's also in the audience, I understand. And this unholy group lived together in a house in Barbary Walk. One Ho Kwang Ping later joined them. <laughs> Fortunately, he was the only one among them who managed to get himself arrested briefly. <laughs> Chun Yong expected to be arrested, but the Singapore government wisely refrained from obliging. Some of you will remember that the old guard of the PAP around that time in the early 1970s produced a book entitled Socialism That Works. I personally think that it might have been better titled Socialism That Is a Work in Progress, for the work can never be finished. Whatever one might say of Singapore as a whole, we can nevertheless say that socialism undoubtedly worked for Messrs. Lu Chunyong Ho Kwam Ping, and also in a different way for Dr. Nolene Hazer. She is one of the few people from that era and milieu who retained her ideals even as she became a member of the establishment. So bad news, Nolene, you are actually a member of the establishment. <laughs> in her case, the international establishment. Nolene is a scholar, but she's also an activist. She is a thinker but she's also a doer. Thought for her has been inseparable from action. She's a scholar activist, you might say a thinker doer, and on a very large scale. She gave her three lectures back in 2021, three lectures in the SR Northern Fellowship series, but she could not hold a book launch back then as she was still, at that point, appointed the UN Secretary General Special Advisor for Myanmar that same year, actually around the same time as her lectures. Now that she has completed 
her 18-month tenure, we can finally celebrate the launch of her book with every one of you here. A series of lectures brought us through Singapore's past, present, and future engagement and experience with multilateral governance. As the only island city-state in the world, um, functioning island city-state, participating in multilateral governance was pivotal in our journey towards a first world nation. Nolene has advised that Singapore should become an epicenter of multilateralism by establish, establishing ourselves as a multilateral hub for a whole host of things, global public health, a digital hub for cybersecurity, and a wealth management hub too. The SR Northern Fellowship will continue to bring feature distinguished thinkers, doers, and leaders. Professor Joseph Liao, our 13th SR Northern Fellow, just recently completed his lecture series on the global and regional tension Singapore has to navigate. His book will be launched in July this year. Uh, following him, we welcome Tan Chong Meng, uh, CEO of PSA International, as our 14th SR Northern Fellow. His upcoming lecture series, Exploring Global Trade and Singapore's Place as a World Connector, will begin next month. Our 15th Fellow will be Professor Lili Kong, President of SMU, who will provide an updated account for Singapore of the idea of a university. This is not her title, it's just a title I've conferred um, for her. Um, but finally, thank you, Nolene, for enriching our understanding of the crucial role of multilateral governance in Singapore's past and the pivotal place it might have in our future. But thank you above all for being such a wonderful example of what it means to be an engaged intellectual. Many of, our, many of the people of our generation all talked in very grand terms about being engaged and an intellectual in the public sphere, but very few of us put it into action systematically throughout their lives. And you are one of the few. Thank you so much. Thank you, Director. May I now invite our guest of honor, Dr. Vivian Balakrishnan, to deliver his remarks. Minister, please. Thank you. Uh, Janadas Devan, the director, you're still director, right, of the IPS. <laughs> Noeline Hazer, of course, Tan Ing Chai, president. Uh, Danny Kwa, Tommy. Uh, I can't match that colorful, anecdotal, uh, you know, personal, powerful speech of, of Janadas because I didn't know uh, Noeline at an age of infatuation. <laughs> and I didn't know all the co-conspirators of that age and in that era. In fact, I suspect many of you hatched your plots on this very campus. <laughs> but it's worth reflecting even as we live in a time, a distempered time, a dysfunctional time. Uh, you know, a time when there's so much that's wrong with the world and a time in which it's even more hostile for a tiny city-state like ours, to also reflect that there is still that need for idealism. There's still that need for good spirit of good relationships and hope and optimism. And of course, needless to say from a diplomatic angle, that ability to charm to infect people with hope and optimism, and then to actually get your hands dirty and sweaty by actually going into the trenches. And on that note, I just want to echo what Janadas just said, that we have to congratulate Nolene for, in a sense, you know, it's too early to talk about a lifetime's work, but for all the work you have done up to now, and that you, as Janadas has said, have lived up to your ideals. You have not shied away from getting your hands dirty. You have not shied away from using your considerable intellectual and emotional skills to do your best. Not everything has worked out according to plan. And that's in the nature of our world. But never losing hope, never losing that beautiful smile, and that ability to infect others and to bring people on this journey. I should also say, since you know, we're here 
and this is in fact a uh, tribute to Mr. Asan Arden, who many of us knew. Um, he is not an Oli Nazer, and there are stark contrasts with him, but I think we can all agree that he was a man, a very practical man, and yet had an unerring sense of where the North Star was. And in the way he chose people to work with, and the way he assessed people, it was very practical, very pragmatic, very realistic, shorn of all the literary adornments. But he wanted things done, and he understood both, I think, the beauty as well as the harsh reality of life. But I want to just take this uh, occasion to say that we are all here, friends of Nolin, to recognize what she has done. She has been a trailblazer. Trailblazer for Singaporeans and a trailblazer for Singaporean women. You did not take the conventional path, the easy path. Um, she spent a lifetime with the United Nations at a time when not many Singaporeans would have chosen that. There were easier pathways for someone with your talents to pursue. But you served at the UN, you became the first woman to be the Executive Secretary of the UN Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific ASCAP for short. And you also the UN Under Secretary General. You were the highest ranking Singaporean. I mean, I was the, the Texas highest ranking Singaporean woman, but actually we should say the highest ranking Singaporean uh, to have served in the UN. And in doing so, you've made a real difference for Singapore, for Singapore citizens, and indeed for the wider constituency whom we know you feel so strongly for. You've played a pivotal role in the Security Council's adoption of Resolution 1352 on Women, Peace and Security. And I've lost count of the missions you've made to conflict-afflicted countries in order to ensure, or at least to facilitate, its implementation. And of course, we know more recently, and you know, we've commiserated during your most recent appointment as a UN Secretary General Special Envoy on Myanmar. That your appointment may have technically ended. We know the work is not over, and that agony of that country continues. I recall sitting in the audience, I think I was seated right that side, on Chun Yong's side, as you were delivering the lectures in this hall in 21. Uh, you remember there was still COVID. I think we were all still wearing masks. There were even restrictions as to how much we could socialize and consume uh, together. But I recall those lectures, and I'm very glad you've now put them together in a book and given all of us, your fans and friends, a chance to celebrate the launch of this book. So congratulations, Nolene, and uh, this is just one stage. I'm sure there'll be other stages of life and contributions to me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. May I now invite Dr. Nolene Hazel to deliver her remarks, please. Wow, after knowing all my background, what can I say? <laughs> Except that it's such a great pleasure uh, to launch this book and uh, such, such, such a great honor in the presence of our guest of honor, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Dr. Vivian Balakrishna, and all of you, Excellencies, friends, dear friends and colleagues for coming this evening. I know that many of you have so, such a lot to do, but you took time to come and I just want to say a big thank you. And I have to thank uh, Prof. Ko and everyone else who have actually made sure that I was always on the right track. And then, <laughs> so, uh, so I uh, normally on these kind of journeys, you are never alone. There's so many people contribute to the kind of uh, community that support you. I have to, so to confess that the launch uh, delayed over a year due to my last uh, UN assignment. But it is even more timely today, given the current threats in our very turbulent world. 
and also to the upcoming UN Summit for the Future later this year, which I know, uh, Minister, that you will be attending and leading as well. My thanks um, to IPS Director Janada Stevan, whom I knew as a young boy, <laughs> but I wouldn't tell you all the things that he did, but, but, but thank you uh, for your very kind, thoughtful introduction, Jenna does, but also to a big thanks to your staff for pulling all this together under your, your kind of leadership. And uh, Foreign Minister, what can I say except a big thank you for your very insightful remarks. You haven't forgotten anything, you put everything together so beautifully and also pushed us into the future. So now about the book. Now, the, this book delves into the crucial tasks of securing our future. Singapore's trajectory, past, present, and future is linked to and reliant on multilateral governance. With decolonization, countries survive better in a world governed by the rule of law and where there are international norms that respect the sovereignty of states. Now, from the very start of nationhood, Singapore applied for UN membership, which was crucial for international recognition, territorial integrity, and self-determination. Now, as Janadas has already said, as the world's only island city-state, remaining isolated has never been a viable option in our transition from third world to first. But both Singapore and Asia have reaped tremendous benefits from the rule-based multilateral order established post-World War II. And this was grounded in shared values, norms, institutions, and fostered a global community. Now across this three-part lecture series, I reflected on how Singapore has experienced multilateral governance and how our country can contribute to its strengthening amidst the complex challenges of the 21st century. Now, as the rule-based multilateral system has now been weakened and can no longer be relied upon to ensure peace and security for all, how can we build upon the enduring vision of the UN Charter and create a new inclusive and effective multilateralism? What does Singapore's engagement with and rejuvenation of this multilateral landscape entail? How do we ensure future global security and simultaneously shape what we can become as a nation in a networked and emerging multipolar world. Now, the book em embarks on a brief journey through time. So my first lecture, Grand Transitions, our multilateral journey, look at grand transitions that have shaped our world. So just for a moment, let me invite you to cast your minds to a pivotal moment in world history nearly 80 years ago. The aftermath of World War II was marked by immense devastation, with 85 million lives lost, and the world left wounded, fractured, and dehumanized. The atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki underscored humanity's capacity for destruction and raise existential questions about our future. Now, in response, world leaders of 50 nations convened in San Francisco in 1945. Their task was nothing less than to establish a new rule-based world order grounded in trust and cooperation. The UN Charter emerged from their solidarity, their political skills, and collective leadership. Pledging to safeguard future generations from the horrors of war and uphold the dignity of every single individual. This was a historical moment of courage. It was a moment that heralded the dawn of a new era 
in multilateral governance, offering hope for a more peaceful and secure world. How have we fared? Over the decades, the principles of multilateralism have guided us, delivering independence, peace, and prosperity for billions. However, deep divides and challenges remain. Billions of people are still marginalized, excluded from the benefits of technology, from social and economic progress, or caught in conflicts they did not create. Events like the 2008 global financial crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic have highlighted vulnerabilities requiring serious attention. Now, the lecture looks at Singapore's journey during this period, influenced by its mindset, choices, and partnerships, which has contributed to the development of Rising Asia. The first lect lecture demonstrates that multilateral governance works best with responsible corporate governance, and when effective democratic governance is practiced by UN member states. It acknowledges the gaps between multilateral norms and their impact on people's lives, stressing the need for alignment between aspiration and practice. So as we strive for a secure future, we must address the root causes of instability, emphasize the importance of international cooperation and solidarity as self-interest, and advocate for multilateral governance informed by both its successes and failures. So that is really the lesson that came out of my chapter one. Now, in my second lecture, I explored the topic of great disruptions, struggle for a normative future. Humanity now stands at a crossroad, where the effectiveness of multilateral governance and our individual choices will determine whether we face breakdown or breakthrough in the face of four current major disruptions. And these are, which we have just experienced, the global health pandemics, climate crises, challenges of the cyber world, and global conflicts. These interconnected disruptions pose unprecedented unprecedented threats to human well-being and sustainability, requiring new normative frameworks in multilateral governance. I underscored the importance of investing in sustainable and inclusive development, global health, peace, and human security as essential global public goods. Now, how do we navigate these challenges? Can Singapore play a pivotal role in shaping the multilateral landscape? My lecture examines Singapore's leadership in amplifying the voices and interests of medium and small states in multilateral forums, supporting vaccine multilateralism, taking climate action, and creating a cohesive and more gender equal society. Now, in so doing, our country is contributing to a more equitable, inclusive, and sustainable normative future where more individuals can, can thrive. I think the key message that I wanted to drive here is how we act as a country, as a group, as individuals can make a big difference. My third and final lecture, Securing Our Future, a renewed multilateralism, directs our attention to the challenges and opportunities ahead. Dear friends and excellencies, our current era resembles the pivotal moments faced by previous generations. The framework of multilateral governance that has safeguarded our presence requires revitalization and reinforcement to address the interconnected disruptions threatening our future. While the UN remains crucial, its efficacy has waned. 
making it insufficient to ensure global peace and security alone. There's great urgency to rebuild the functioning and credibility of the multilateral system, as we're all witnessing in the wake of the Gaza crisis. The world's failure to act swiftly and decisively to impose a ceasefire in Gaza, protect civilian lives and infrastructure, and prevent what the UN Secretary General has called a crisis of humanity and a graveyard for children has shattered global confidence in the multilateral system. The gravity of our historical moment cannot be overstated. We are watching international humanitarian law and human rights law cast aside in the absence of a robust mechanism of enforcement. The stakes are high. The world cannot afford to wait any longer to promote accountability, address double standards, and the breakdown of trust, to restore faith in a rule-based world order that is now on life support. This requires exceptional leadership from all nations to work collectively to rebuild a more effective and credible multilateral framework, starting with long overdue reforms of some of its key institutions and rules to prevent future crises and devastation. To shape the future we desire, we must repair trust and solidarity, restore social inclusion and dignity, and revalue care for each other and our planet. And this requires global action through enhanced multilateralism, but this time complemented by local and regional efforts by nations and corporations, as well as movements and networks of people around the world grounded in community and individual empowerment, but boasted by global solidarity. It falls upon our generation to revitalize the rule-based multilateral order, ensuring the security of our shared future. How we respond to this critical task will define all our legacy. What vision do we hold for Singapore society? What role will we play in shaping our collective destiny? In this lecture, I shared some important points outlined in the UN Secretary General's Antonio Guterres' report on our common agenda for the upcoming UN Summit of the Future. And he talked about a renewed global social contract, the governance of our global commons and public goods, a new agenda for peace that he has put a lot of emphasis on, and an inclusive, networked, effective multilateralism. I reflected on three ways that Singapore can secure its future in our changing world by contributing to the larger well-being of people and planet, a hub for global public health, and I know there are many doctors here, a digital hub for cybersecurity, a, fi a financial hub for an inclusive and sustainable future. Singapore's success as a nation, together with our brilliant multilateral diplomacy, has enhanced our international profile, expanded our network of friends, and protected our interests as a small country. The question now is, can Singapore emerge as a beacon and a discussion space for new multilateralism, advocating for both enlightened self-preservation and committed stewardship of global public goods and our global commons. These questions guide us as we strive to construct a sustainable, peaceful, and fair future. Now, as I look around this room today, there is such exceptional people and such exceptional talents here, Ta just here alone. So let us dare to reimagine our world and collaborate to build multilateral governance fit for the 21st century. If we succeed, it will be our children's turn to recount how our generation rose to great challenges, healed deep divisions, 
weathered storms of anger and I may even add hatred from time to time, and secure the future where coming generations can flourish. We owe it to our children and, their grand and to our grandchildren. I hope that the three lectures in this book will ignite constructive conversations towards envisioning a promising future. A future that celebrates the human spirit, where every person can live in peace, freedom, and dignity, and most of all, where our humanity can prevail. I thank all of you for coming this afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Hazel. Please remain on stage. May I now invite Minister and Director to the stage for the launch of the book, please. We will now launch the book. <laughs> Dr. Hazel will now present Minister with a copy of the book. And now, Director will present Dr. Hazel with a token of appreciation from IPS. Mm. Please remain on stage for a photo together. The book is now launched. Thank you everyone for attending and have a good evening ahead.